Justice and is being co coordinated by the NQSCN. So I welcome all the panelists and our speaker, Ms. Jodi Kausir, and all the attendees to this webinar. So uh, this webinar, we are going to have an interactive session regarding the family integrated care. As all of us know, for the growth and development of a newborn, a critical newborn who is in the NICU, family has a very big role to play at, uh, at the time of point of time when the baby is sick thereafter also. So it's a very important concept which all of us have to understand and make it a part of our care provision to the baby, a family integrated care and approach. And with this regard, we have with us Ms. Jodi Kossier, who works in the University of Birmingham City in England, who has got many years of experience as a nurse. And especially she is the lead nurse for the family integrated care in the neonatal intensive care unit. Her role has been in, uh, to support the families of the sick and the premature babies, which helping the building of relationship and aiding the bonding of the families with their babies. And she also facilitates the parental learning so that they can care for their in, infant uh, throughout the journey in the stay of the, in, in the unit, as well as to build their confidence in preparation for, the, for going home. With this uh, small introduction, I welcome Ms. Jodi Kossier and uh, invite you to kindly take over from here. Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, I'm yeah. just going to share my screen. Okay, thanks for that really um, nice introduction. So, um, I've been the family integrated care lead on my unit in Birmingham City, England now for a year. It's very much still a work in progress. But here in the UK, the um, National Health Service is really focusing on establishing family integrated care and the model of family integrated care into all neonatal units. Um, and hopefully in the next five years, um, there'll be progress made in every unit, like I said, across the UK. So it's something that I'm really passionate about and it's something that our parents um, also feel is really um, important in the care that they receive. Um, and we have seen the significant improvements that it has made in the care that we give. So first of all, we need to understand what we mean by family integrated care. So it's a model of care which is an extension of family-centered care, which we probably have all um, heard of, but there's no uniform um, terminology for what family-centered care is. And every neonatal unit across the world will have their own variation of what this actually means. But family-centered care is when we take the values, the beliefs, the experiences of our parents and incorporate that into the care that we then give our neonates. But this is taking it that step further. So with family integrated care, it's about building a partnership between parents and healthcare professionals. It's about promoting the parent infant interactions with hands on care. So parents taking an active role in the care that we and they deliver on the unit. And the main aim is to allow parents to feel like they are the parent. So we know that when our babies come to us on the neonatal unit, it can be a very traumatic time. Parents um, are very confused and overwhelmed with what is happening. Um, and they may feel like they've handed over the care to us as healthcare professionals. And it may, uh, it may stop them feeling like they have control and that they are the parent. And it's really important that we support parents in making the decisions for their infants. So we're not making the decisions for them. They're making the decisions with us as healthcare professionals. So I'm just going to share with you a little bit of the background of where family integrated care started. So this started in Estonia in Tallinn's Children's Hospital, and they built a mother infant unit. So a unit that was based around the mother and infant relationship. And this was back in um, the late 70s. And really the main leading principle was to connect and bond mother and baby. And they really believed that the separation had adverse effects on both maternal and infant health. 
So they wanted to minimise that separation, so allowed the care to be delivered by mothers 24 hours a day and had the mothers stay in with their infants. They used minimal technology and there was very little contact between medical and nursing staff, so there was only contact when and where it was necessary. So about 10 years later, they compared data of those babies that had the care delivered by the mother versus those that didn't. So the mothers could not stay for whatever reason. And they found that there were increased weight gain for those that was with the mum. There was a 30% reduction in infections, meaning less use of antibiotics and less use of intravenous fluids. And there was this increased confidence in the mother caring for her baby and also the attachment and bond. So the model that we see and use today um, was formed in um, Mount Sinai Hospital by the team there. And off the back of this research, they conducted a little pilot study back in 2011. They took four cots on their unit. And over a year, they recruited about 40 babies into this um, scheme where they asked parents to be with their baby at least eight hours in a day. They offered um, staff and parent education. So they offered education to parents in how they could take an active role. And they allowed them to be a part of the medical rounds. And then this was rolled out into a bigger randomised control trial, which included 26 units across Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And half of those, so 13 of those, were the intervention site where um, they took on this model of care. And the other 13 continued with their standard um, care that they were giving so we could compare. And they recruited babies that were born less than 33 weeks on low respiratory support and parents having to commit at least six hours a day to the care. And again, it showed similar benefits and more. So again, it proved that there was a reduced hospital acquired infections for those babies that had more parent involvement. There was inc um, improved breastfeeding rates, which speaks for itself increased weight gain, which you can argue impacts development, a reduced length of stay, less readmissions, a lower incidence of retinopathy of prematurity, less parental stress. And again, parents have this increased confidence in caring for their babies, not only on the unit, but well after discharge. So there is further research being done around this model. Um, but the main themes that are coming out of the research are it does improve infant health, infant development, it improves infant parent relationships, and also the mental health of both the parent and the infant. And all this research can be found at www.familyintegratecare.com, where the team at Mount Sinai Hospital have put together all their research for anyone to access and have a look at. So UNICEF, in partnership with the World Health Organization, realized how significant this model of care is. And they together um, started the Baby Friendly Initiative. So the Baby Friendly Initiative is a global initiative which aims to improve the standard of care for all of our babies across the world and making sure that we give best practice and give them the best start in life. So there are three standards to the neonatal sector. So for neonatal care, they um, advise that we support parents to have a close and loving relationship with their child, which I'll go on to explain a little bit more detail in a moment. The second is that we enable babies to receive breast milk and breastfeed where possible. But obviously for that to happen, you need mothers to be present. Their production of breast milk will be enhanced with closeness and um, being with their baby as much as possible. And then the third one, which is everything that family integrated care is, is valuing parents as partners in care. So looking a little bit more into how this supports close and loving relationships. So there's loads of research out there now, which um, concludes that the first 1001 days, which is pregnancy through to two, two and a half years, 
is a very crucial phase in a baby's development and their brain development. And this really sets them up um, for good health, not only in childhood, but in adulthood. So it's through supporting close and loving relationships in this early stage that we are really going to enable our babies to thrive. So following birth, a baby's brain will develop really rapidly and it is influenced by the experiences and interactions with their parents and their environment. Early relationships between infants and parents, we know build healthy brains and to really make that secure relationship, they need at least one nurturing caregiver that responds to their needs. And on the neonatal unit, this should be the primary caregiver, which in most cases is the parent. We really need to support this relationship forming from quite early on. Um, and as healthcare professionals, we need to facilitate that. So the benefits are that babies will feel secure, they'll feel safe, which releases oxytocin, which we know helps the brain development. It will enable babies to manage their emotions and behaviours because they know when they're stressed, their needs will be met, they will feel um, tended to, and the parents will also have this purpose that um, they are the parent. And then this enables the trust, the trusting relationship to build, and then this carries them throughout life and enables them to build trusting relationships all through their life. So it improves both mental and physical health. So why is this so important then on the neonatal unit? So we know that this bonding process that normally happens after birth has many barriers on the neonatal unit. So one of those is obviously physical separation at birth. So the baby is taken to the neonatal unit and there's that initial separation from the parent. Then the neonatal environment itself has many barriers. So you've got incubators, you've got machines, you've got wires, you've got the noises. It's an alien environment to our parents. And you've got the parents' emotions. They will be feeling grief, fear. They'll be very overwhelmed. They'll feel powerlessness. They might even feel anger sometimes. And these alone can stop a parent getting involved in the baby's care. So some units still have um, restricted access, so parents don't have 24-7 access to their babies. And as healthcare professionals, we can sometimes actually be a barrier in ourselves um, to parents. And at the moment, um, we are um, facing coronavirus and COVID-19, which is presenting as a really big barrier, I would imagine, across the world to the neonatal care that we give at the moment. So I'm going to explain now more about the model of care and what it looks like. So there are four pillars to family integrated care. There is staff education. So staff need to know why, why we were asking them to um, commit to this model. Parent education, the environment and psychosocial support. So each one of these form the foundations of family integrated care. But it's really important to note that all units will have different barriers, um, different challenges. So we do need to adapt um, to our own unit. And what, what um, works in one unit might not actually work in another. So it's a bit of a trial and error. But as long as we get the main pillars and we start working towards this, then family integrated care will really work. So the first pillar then is staff education. And the aim of this is to provide staff with the skills to enable them to educate, mentor and support parents in caring for their infant on the neonatal unit. So as healthcare professionals, we like to know the benefits of the care that we give and we want the research to back up why we're doing it. So it's important that we share this with staff and they really understand the important role the family has to play in the baby's life on the neonatal unit for development well into adulthood. And through that, we can promote and support the integration of families from arrival on the unit all the way through to discharge and beyond. 
We also need to equip um, staff with the tools and resources, the communication skills that are essential for them to teach parents and to build um, nurse patient or nurse parent relationships so they can really take family and integrated care forward. And there are loads of different ways that we can um, do staff education. So it can be in small groups, it can be online packages, it can be um, simply sharing the research, um, it can be through webinars like this where we're talking about this model of care. Um, there's loads of support, like I said, on the Family Integrated Care website that people can access to educate themselves why this is so important. So there's loads of ways that we can educate our staff. So the second pillar is parent education. And the aim of parent education is to really give them the skills and tools that they need to confidently and safely care for their infant on the neonatal unit and beyond. Just to note here that obviously as healthcare professionals, we are still um, reliable um, for the care of our infants. So it's very much a partnership and us working with parents and supporting parents to do this. Again, parent education can be offered in a variety of ways. So it could be one-to-one -one at the cut side. It could be in small groups. Through COVID, um, we have offered virtual sessions and we're thinking about doing podcasts. Um, they, you can use a variety of um, resources. So these could be leaflets, display boards. Um, you could use websites. There are a lot of charities out there aimed at supporting um, parents with babies on the neonatal unit but the most simplest one that we find that really works especially if you're just starting out in this process is just allowing parents to be present on the medical rounds so this is a way that we can share information with parents and then they can ask us questions so by, by engaging with them and encouraging them to ask questions, they can learn a lot about their baby's condition, about the care that they are receiving. And then together, we can make decisions about how to move forward with care. And this is actually really um, crucial in empowering parents to feel again like they are the parent. So this is what we kind of use on the unit that I work on and like I said everybody will have um, different perspectives but these are some of the things that we teach parents so we start off with the basics things like nappy care and mouth care for our special care babies it might be bathing them or taking a temperature and it's really important to note here for our really sick and premature babies, these can be really um, frightening and terrifying things to do. So it's really important that when we um, speak to parents, that we take them on an individualized basis and make sure that we are tailoring the care and the education to meet their needs. We shouldn't push parents into this. It should be their choice. They should lead their learning and what they want to get involved with. And it's a case of when they are ready. But we need to encourage, empower and support parents throughout the journey. So as this evolves, then we can start um, making sessions more tailored towards the NICU skills. So changing saturation probes, changing oxygen prongs and what we found is a really good way to make parents feel empowered is to allow them to document. So if they've taken a temperature, allow them to write it on the chart, obviously overseen and checked by the nurse. And this really engages them in the care that they give him. So these are some of the things that parents have told us they really want to know about. So developmental care, the effects of the environment, noise, um, light, skin to skin, they want to know how this affects their baby and what role they can play in that. Brain development is something that a lot of parents want to know about and again their role, so through skin to skin, through contact, through reading, talking to babies, singing to babies when appropriate, it really enhances their brain development. And going back to um, how we form relationships, a big part of that is responsive parenting so parenting parents responding to their baby's needs and we know for our um, premature babies this isn't always easy 
they won't dis they won't behave the same as a term baby. So it's explaining to parents about stress cues, feeding cues, approach cues, then how they then can interact with their child based on all of those things. So we go through the feeding journey with them, what to expect. So right from the beginning, in the first couple of hours of life, we talk about colostrum and expressing, and this can really give mums a purpose, a sense that they can do something straight away for their infant. Then as they progress, um, we support breastfeeding, bottle feeding if needed. And we also get parents involved in nasogastric tube feeds. So they might start off simply by holding the tube um, or the syringe. Then eventually they can um, attend a training session where they become competent to do the nasogastric tube feeds completely independently. And they are actually given the option to also go home with the tube. Um, a little bit early. And then a really crucial part to the neonatal journey is discharge. So we have probably all experienced that the closer we get to discharge, some parents become really anxious because the whole support network that we've given them up until then is about to be taken away. So it's really important that we prepare as much as possible for discharge. And we offer things like basic life support. So what to do if the child stops breathing at home, safe for sleep advice and how to prevent sudden infant death syndrome, how to make up formula feeds safely, administration of medicines if babies are going home with medication, to give the parents the confidence that when they are at home they can meet all of the needs of their children. So the next pillar is the environment. So the aim of this then is to create a environment where parents feel welcome and valued. So I want us all to go back to the first day that we maybe started our jobs at where you work and how scary it was walking into an environment that you didn't know, how lost you felt not knowing where everything was. And then imagine this from a parent's perspective and they've got to deal with the fact that their child is also sick um, and needing our care. So it's really important that parents feel welcome and comfortable so that they can really get involved in the care that um, we give. So we now give 24 hour access to our parents. Um, we do obviously um, tell them that they should go home and rest where appropriate, but they, we, we have no restrictions. We have facilities that support parent integration, so making sure there's a room that they can go sit away from baby to get some rest. They have um, food and drink available, and we have a little kitchenette for them where they can make a hot drink and prepare food. We have overnight stay rooms for those families that live far um, or for those that are unwell, and it's really important that the parents are close. Expressing facilities for mothers who are expressing a comfortable chair next to the bedside so parents can sit and read or have prolonged skin to skin. And recently we've also um, got lockers so that they can put their belongings away safely so they can spend as much time as they need to on the unit. I think it is really important to also note here that for some of our parents, spending prolonged times on the unit isn't always possible. That could be because they've got other infants to care for at home or their family dynamic or it could be financially they can't afford to come in every day or geographically they live a far distance and in that case it's about making the time they do have with their infant the best quality that you can so when they are there they're getting skin to skin they're getting involved in the care and um, you're having those interactions and building that relationship with them. I think a really key part to this is parent orientation to the unit. So when they come to the unit, we're showing them around, letting them know where everything is. And if we can, preparing them for the neonatal unit. So letting them know what to expect before they arrive, telling them about the machines and the wires and the sounds. And if parents are, um, if we know parents are gonna to come to the neonatal unit for care, trying to get them into the unit beforehand and show them around. Again, with COVID, this is very difficult, um, but it's just something to think about moving forward. 
We always advocate minimal separation. So when babies are ready, um, they can be with mom on our transitional care unit, which is transitioning them from the neonatal unit to home where moms and babies can be together and they still receive care from the neonatal team. And it's really important that we don't refer to our parents as visitors because they are parents. OK, so when you call a parent a visitor, it makes them feel less of a parent. So they are the parent. And the last pillar is psychosocial support. So this aims to support parents to overcome their fears, um, to engage in their baby's care. And support is essential for both mental and emotional well-being. Unfortunately, a lot of research coming out of the UK in terms of mental health is showing that the neonatal environment is having a significant impact on um, the mental health of our parents. And actually 80% have said that their mental health is affected in some way, shape or form. Some parents go on to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and some postnatal depression and anxiety. We've had parents, um, when we talk to parents that have been on the, on the neonatal unit previously and what they remember of their time, most often they remember the smells, the sounds, um, and when they come back onto the unit for whatever reason, they can be triggered and have quite an emotional response to the environment. So it's really important that from a mental health point of view, we get early support in. And we are the first port of call as healthcare professionals. We're the ones that are going to be dealing with the parents at the cot side. So it's important that we that we take time to build good um, parent nurse relationships and to build trust with our parents. They need to feel heard. They need to be able to voice their concerns. Um, and we need to be able to talk through them with that. Peer support is actually something that's quite powerful. So um, we advocate veteran parents. Um, so on World Prematurity Day, we always ask previous parents to write letters to those that are on the neonatal unit now as a form of support. And this really validates parents' feelings and it lets them know that what they're feeling is okay and that they're not alone. And again, peer support on the unit at the time, we do recommend that this is facilitated by healthcare professionals, but allowing parents on the unit to talk to each other and share their experiences. And this is actually a very natural evolution of the parent education programme. Like I said, parents really need to have a voice. So it's really important that we get parent feedback. We listen to their experiences, what they think could be improved. Um, and really take that on board as we're moving forward. And again, like I said earlier, a lot of the resources we already have available and the wider family here can be a crucial part of the family support. So these babies and parents are going to go home to family members, to a wider community and actually getting them involved um, can help a family feel very supported. So at the moment, we do have restrictions due to COVID. So we do um, try and encourage siblings to draw pictures, to um, record themselves reading a book that parents can play on the unit. And we do video calls to the wider family so they can get updates. And we also um, keep a diary for our parents from the baby so that they can share that with the family also. And sometimes we do have to... Um, we do have to realise that no matter how much support we have on the unit, sometimes it is not enough. And we do need to get some outside help or refer parents on to um, professional help, whether that be for their mental well-being, emotional well-being. It could simply be just referring them on to some charities that could support them. But it's about identifying those families that need support and taking action on that. There are other ways that we can support parents on the unit and these are the things that we've implemented here so it's about recognizing and celebrating the achievements and the milestones of the baby so once they've reached a kilo or once they've had their first bath or their first feed um, it's about celebrating those with the family so that they 
are focusing less on maybe the negative and focusing more on the positive. We really help families make memories. So we keep journals, we encourage them to take photos and we mark important occasions. So if it's a parent's birthday or a sibling's birthday, we will send a card to them from the baby or from the unit to let them know that we really value them as part of um, the family. And reassurance and praise is really key. So when a parent is scared or they're worried about getting involved, but they take that leap, and they work with you. It's about giving them that reassurance that you're there, but then praising them as well when they've done it. And again, reiterating why that is so important. So like I said, I've been in this post now a year. This is very much still for our unit a work in progress. Um, we talk with units all over the UK and we share what goes well on one unit, what doesn't go well, and we all keep sharing ideas. But I really believe that family integrated care can be um, initiated on all neonatal units across the world with a lot of the resources that you already have available to you. So just like to, um, so when it comes to implementing family integrated care, then I've just come up with some very, um, very key points that I think really help move this forward. So you need to be able to identify people that are passionate about family integrated care that really want to drive this forward and then create a, um, a small group within your unit. And this should, this should really be across professions, so nurses, doctors and other allied health professionals that you can all come together and discuss what's important for your unit and how you're going to move this forward. You need to look at what resources you already have available, like I've said, and we really need to engage all staff with this. So this is why education is so important. But I think setting very clear goals um, is crucial at the beginning. So my first goal was simply to just make sure that all parents were orientated to the unit within 24 hours of um, admi admission. I then told all the staff about this and why it was important. We then rolled this out and then we looked at those families that for whatever reason didn't get an orientation, what were the barriers. We came back together and then we discussed how we could move it forward. So it's very much a work in progress. And it's very important that throughout this whole thing that parents are included because they're the ones that will be able to tell you what they need what they would like um, to be taught, what information they want to receive um, and what they would like to see improved. So that's my overview on family integrated care and how we've tried to implement it and how we are moving forward with implementing it here in the UK. So thank you everybody for listening and if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Jodi. No that problem. was a very, very insightful, uh, insightful presentation. Uh, as you rightly said, it is a very new topic, and I think you're spearheading the, uh, the cause for the new needs uh, very well. And it has uh, some important lessons for us as well. I think one of the important lessons for me personally today has been how we are in the movement of uh, shifting the role of a parent from just being a visitor to being a parent and probably mm -hmm. also being a caretaker for the uh, new and uh, be able to achieve uh, wonderful outcomes. So thank you so much. And, no problem. Uh, there are a few questions for you, and I will start taking them uh, one by one. So there is a question from uh, Anand Kumar, and uh, it is about uh, how you started the education. I think what he means is the education of the parents. Was it done one on one? Was it a, uh, a group setting? How did you actually start with educating the parents about this family? Okay, so this started off as one to one. So initially, we produced a um, leaflet on family integrated care, which had very basic information on why it was important for families to get involved and the benefits of that. We then encouraged them to have conversations with their nurse about this. 
We then as a unit identified um, key areas that we wanted parents to get involved with. So at the beginning, it was very basic skills. So nappy, mouth, and then we rolled out some information to staff to say, these are the topics we really want parents to engage in. Um, and then we encouraged parents to then, um, encourage staff to move that forward. So it's very much one-to-one -one at the um, cut side. And then as we got more and more feedback and parents started to say, um, we wanna learn more, we, asked them what they wanted to learn about. So they would say they wanted to learn more about developmental care because they'd had conversations or heard um, nurses speaking about it. So then we rolled out a more formal program. So um, we're very lucky to have um, allied health professionals on our unit. So we have physios, occupational health therapists and dietitians. So they would offer an hour session in a week where parents could come to that session and it would be very much parent led. So it would be a case of what do you want to know about? And then it, it would be led like that. Like I said, unfortunately due to COVID, we've had to stop those um, group sessions at the moment being face to face, but we have tried to do some online where possible. But to answer the question, yeah, it just started off as one-to-one -one and then evolved from there. So uh, there's a question which I would actually like to address to you, which stems from this first is that uh, I'm sure, for example, if there are 10 uh, neonates who are admitted in your unit, so uh, when a neonate comes in, uh, is this option uh, given to every parent when the baby is admitted regarding who all want to actually get into the family integrated care process? And is it tailor-made to the amount that they want to contribute to uh, caregiving of their infants? Is that, uh, that tailor-made? Yeah, so we always tailor, yeah, so it's always tailored to each individual parent. So we kind of set it out in levels. So it was level one would be the basics, level two would be parents as partners in care, and level three would be preparing for discharge. So we would try and encourage all parents, no matter um, why they were on the neonatal unit, to start at level one. So get involved. So making sure they knew about skin to skin, about containment holding if they didn't, um, if they couldn't get their babies out, um, assisting with feeds um, and stuff like that, just reading to their baby. And then we would encourage them, but it was very much a case of the parents would choose whether they wanted them to take on more. So for example, nasogastric tube feeding, we offer it, but if parents say, no, it's not for them, we'll explore that. But if it's something that they don't want to do, it's not it's not pushed on them. And then we go into level three towards the end where we are getting parents ready for home. So really, yeah, it's very much tailor made for parents. And the importance of that really is because we do find some parents come and they want to do everything and it's great. But for mm. others, they have such intense anxiety and stress already that actually by getting them too involved, it can add to their stress and their anxiety. So it's, you do have to focus on what's right for that family at that time. Thank you so much. I think that answers the question very well. Dr. Suprabha, I think uh, yeah. you wanted to say something. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Jodi. There's a question from Anju John. She yeah. says, as a nurse, should uh, we discuss the baby's condition and the prognosis to the parents? We believe that we should always be very open and honest about the baby's um, condition and prognosis. So, um, yeah, we always have those conversations on a regular basis. I mean, parents are always um, intuitive anyway, and they want to know those sort of questions. Um, so, yes, we're very open and honest about those things with our parents. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh... There's a question from Dr. Vidyadhar Rangal. He wants to know regarding how common COVID in childhood or through transplacental transmission is observed in UK. In your unit, have you come across babies who have been COVID positive? No, so we haven't had any babies. Um, definitely through um, placental transfer, we haven't had any. We've had our very first COVID positive baby only last week. 
and this was because baby was staying with um, on postnate, so it was with its mother for a couple of days before coming to the neonatal unit and mum was positive. But baby presented with very little symptoms, tested positive, but had no symptoms and doesn't seem to have affected the baby's health. Right. Thank you. There's another question from uh, Dr. An Anand Kumar. He wants to know about the challenges other than the pandemic in implementing the program and how did you overcome them during your journey of implementation of FN? Okay, that's a really good question. And there are quite a few. So from a staff point of view, we were asking them to change the way that they cared for neonates. So we were asking them to take more of a step back. And we found that for healthcare professionals and nurses, that was actually quite difficult for them to do. We were asking them to allow the parents to do it and them observe. Um, so this took time, it took patience, we just had to keep working at it, we had to keep rolling out education. Um, so all staff now, um, when they are um, starting on the unit, get a education session, they get a competency booklet, which goes through the main aspects of family integrated care. Um, with parents, um, there were many challenges, so sometimes our parents, their first language wasn't English. So how do we overcome that to get them involved in the care? So we had to think about looking at getting interpreter, interpreters in to making sure that they got the same care and opportunities that everybody else had. Um, another thing was um, for young parents that were quite shy, they were scared to get involved and ask questions. Um, and luckily, we've just been appointed a clinical psychologist to the team who really works with parents to really support them in having a voice. Um, another thing that we found was that a lot of the research advocates for parents to be there for six to eight hours minimum in a day. And this wasn't always possible for our unit. So some parents could only stay for a couple of hours because they had other children. Um, some parents couldn't come every day because of um, they didn't have the finances to travel. So we really had to adapt it so that the time they did spend on the unit was of high quality. And we made sure that when they did come, they were able to get involved in the care that way. I think you are mute. Thank you. There's another question from Ms. Uh, Gina Pradeep. She wants to know whether there's any protocol or a policy existing in your facility regarding the level of care that can be given by the parents towards the child. So no, so that's something that we are developing. So um, the Baby Friendly Initiative um, has wrote um, a education package and they provide some key points and um, policies around how we should implement this. But we haven't actually got one on our unit at present, but we are working with other neonatal units in the area to develop one um, actually in the new year so that we can um, uniform the care that we give. Thank you. There's, uh, uh, there's a question by Ms. Simi Mol Soman. The question is incomplete. Uh, Ms. Simi, uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Maybe there's some concern, the audio side. Another thing is like, what were the challenges done, uh, ch changes which were done in the NICU to the to cater to the family integrated care is something which Ms. Uh, Dr. Anupa wants to know. Um, so, well, there, there was loads of changes. So we look, first of all, we looked at the environment. So what could we change in the environment? So we didn't have anywhere for parents to prepare hot food. So we made sure that that was one of the first things that we put in. So they had a microwave and a fridge so that they can store food and have food. Um, we made sure that all of our chairs were comfortable and they could recline. So we spent money buying new chairs um, so that parents could be comfortable next to their baby and they could have prolonged skin to skin. 
we brought loads more um, pumps so that um, mums could express by the bedside and be next to their baby. Um, we developed um, an admission pack so that all parents on admission would get a letter um, from us, from the unit to say welcome, tell them about when they could visit, what they needed to bring. Um, so we really focused first on the environment and how we could change that. Um, and then we then changed the education structure. So like I said, we then made it mandatory for all staff then to have family integrated care as part of the teaching. And then we then started working on resources that we could give to parents. So leaflets, videos, we are currently working with other neonatal units to um, create a website that they can access. So there's a lot of changes that, that we have made, but like I said, it, it wasn't overnight. It's very much, it happens over time. Yes, yes that's true. As a team, there are a lot of challenges. And uh, one thing which uh, Dr. Vikram had a query, he's like, how does the team overcome the challenge of other team members, that is the healthcare workers, feeling uncomfortable in the presence of parents, especially in a very sick neonate? Yeah, so that's actually been one of the things that we have noticed recently is probably something that staff um, struggle with the most. And that comes down to some some staff are really good at dealing with parents and how we, and the emotions that come with having a baby in the neonatal unit and it doesn't come naturally to others so we are currently looking at providing a teaching package to all staff about communication so how do we communicate with parents empath with empathy how do we get the most out of building relationships with parents? So that is something that's actually um, developing at the moment. And for those staff um, that are coming into intensive care that are new, they would always have a um, more senior, more experienced nurse um, that is mentoring them and, and working with them to overcome some of those challenges. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's uh, one more thing which we would like to know is, is there any protocol for getting the mother tested for COVID in this pandemic time before the uh, get, going into the family integrated care? So um, all of our mothers are swabbed on admission to the, um, to the maternity unit. Hmm. So all moms are swabbed as routine. Um, and then we always ask them before they enter the neonatal unit if they've had any symptoms of, if they've been in contact with anybody. Um, so we screen them before they come in. We don't actually take temperatures at the moment, but that is something that has been discussed. Okay. Any mothers that have come into contact or obviously test positive, unfortunately, they will have to um, isolate. But we try and keep communication going through video calls, FaceTime, Zoom and stuff like that. Okay, so these are like all those mothers who have delivered in the setup in case a baby is coming directly, I mean, having been delivered at some other setup and parents are coming with the baby or being referred to your setup. In that scenario also, are you getting the COVID testing for the mother? Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So another thing uh, which uh, Dr. Anindita Bhomik, uh, she wanted to know, given the varied educational and understanding levels in the parents, did you use any audiovisual aid to educate them? And if yes, how do you think they worked? Yes, that's a really, really good point. And actually that's something that we've um, incorporated only recently. So um, originally um, it would be through just talking for our education sessions. And we found that our written documents also could be quite um, overwhelming. So we started to use pictures and we do feel that parents respond better to pictures. Um, so when we are doing our education sessions, like I said, it's very much led by the parents. So there's no uniform structure to how we deliver those. Um, but we do have key resources. So we have um, pictures of what feeding cues may look like. Um, we have pictures of the different ways um, they can get involved with developmental care. Um, for the nasogastric tube feeding and for our basic life support sessions, we do live demonstrations with a doll and they can also practice on a doll also doing both um, nasogastric tube feeds 
and um, be a less before they actually go ahead and do it for themselves. That's a really key point. And actually we have found that it's massively beneficial to have um, pictures. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you. So uh, we wanted to know, is there any course available which uh, if for those who are interested in learning regarding the FI care model? So um, a lot of our courses are ran through different centers, but actually a lot of what we teach has come from um, the Family Integrated Care website, like I said, that was um, produced by Mount Sinai Hospital. And they do yearly conferences. So every year they do a conference um, somewhere in the world. We actually had one in the UK last year. Um, so you, anybody can attend those. And the baby friendly standards can all be found on the UNICEF um, website. Um, and I think if you go to, I know there's one for the UK, so UNICEF UK, it will go through all of the standards and there are teaching packages and videos that you can access on there as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Vikram, uh, any, anything from your side, anything more would you like to? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Suprabha, Ms. Judy. I think uh, this was a wonderful session and I really enjoyed it. In India, we have been trying to develop the developmentally supportive care model in which uh, one of the previous five core principles of developmentally supportive care model, we mm -hmm. had family centered care. We were not using the term family integrated care. We were using family centered care. Yes. The biggest challenges uh, for us uh, during the COVID times definitely has been that we have to weigh the risk benefit. Like for example, in my unit in New Delhi, uh, we are not having a routine, uh, you know, uh, protocol of testing all mothers and many of them are coming day in and day out from the community, often exposing healthcare workers to COVID and uh, mm -hmm. that is one big challenge. Prior to that, uh, we have uh, definitely uh, allowed the parents well into the neonatal ICU also, even ventilated babies, the mothers are there on the rounds. But in India, you know, I think we need to work very much to encourage them something like the ask me three model. They, they don't ask any questions. They are very shy mm -hmm. or they are timid or there is a barrier or a, there is an aura when we are in rounds. But definitely I have noticed as a professor of neonatology that the moment we have the mothers and that is what I shared with the, the larger NQCN team also. If you have the mothers who are present by the bedside of the newborn, as a doctor, as a nurse, you become more empathetic somehow you become more conscious of yeah. your actions and somehow you want to engage with them and often you stop and and i personally noticed that the duration which i spent with each of the newborn babies increased by at, as much as 10 to 15 minutes last year when i had two mothers who were very very interactive and both the babies did extremely well and they are now growing so this yes. was my observation that it is beneficial. Mm -hmm. We need to implement it into our units. Thank you so much for that excellent session. We would look forward to be interacting with you further on similar sessions. Yes, yeah. Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jordi. This, uh, the, this is another uh, last question from uh, Ms. Simi Mol regarding how do you encourage the mothers who don't want to breastfeed their babies? How do you so, overcome this challenge? Yeah, so I think the key here is at the very beginning, especially with our premature babies, is to, is to dissociate the difference between breastfeeding and breast milk. So at the beginning, we, we talk to parents about colostrum and breast milk and the importance of that for our premature babies and explain it like a medicine. So they need it to obviously protect their gut, to help their brain, to help their growth, um, to um, protect them from infection. And we explain this to parents in a way that we get, we say to them, when it comes to the, the, um, the point where we're going to start feeding, if you don't want to breastfeed, we won't make you, but let's just see how we go. And then when we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. And actually, we find that a lot of our mothers, because they're expressing the milk and they want to do that because of how important that is, they naturally transition into breastfeeding okay, anyway. And they want to give right. it a go. Okay. That's true. That's true. 
So thank you so much for such a good interactive session. I would like to thank uh, my co-panelist, uh, co uh, Dr. Anupama, which because of audio issue, we could not uh, have uh, more of uh, her views on this. And at the same time, I'm really grateful to our speaker, Ms. Jodi Kosya, who uh, gave us an overview regarding the family integrated care and all our panelists and all our participants, the nurses, the midwives, the doctors, all the healthcare pro uh, professionals who have been very closely associated with the care of a newborn for attending this webinar, taking out their precious time at this evening hours and being with us and uh, uh, having an interactive session with all of us. I would like to extend my thank you to uh, UNICEF with whose support we have been, able, we have been uh, conducting this global webinar on the family integrated care. And I would like to extend my special thanks to Dr. Vikram, Dr. Sushil, Dr. Rahul, and our NQSN team members who have made it possible to have the, uh, this webinar moving on so smoothly with all the participants and the speakers and the panelists and everything. So with this, we come to an end of this webinar. I would uh, once again like to thank Ms. Jodi to, uh, uh, to have given us this opportunity for interacting with you and having uh, sensitizing us regarding the family integrated care. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very you. much.